May we give our confession of faith. At this time, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet each other. Let us experience the joy of the gospel. With this, today's message is entitled, The Gospel Unity of Life and Fellowship. The book of 1 John, which we'll examine starting today, is a letter written by one disciple that was left alive out of all of the 12 disciples of Jesus, and that was Apostle Paul. His older brother James was the first martyr, and all other disciples except for Judas Iscariot were martyred. But John was but John lived a long life until the age of 94 and showed us a pastoral ministry. Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation along with the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The Gospel of John contains the foundations of spiritual life and walk of faith, so much so that it is recommended to newcomers when they first read the Bible because it talks about all the foundations uh, that we must know when starting a walk of faith. If you look at John chapter 20, verses 31, verse 31, John reveals the purpose of writing the Gospel of John. It says, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Amen. It's not just the book of John, but the 66 books of the Bible were all written so that we may know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that whoever believes in Him will receive eternal life. All humans live with a physical flesh. We all die once. And it's been, this, it's been set for all humans to die once, but many unbelievers think that with their life, that is the end and that's why many people take their own lives but we do not end with our physical life but because we have a spiritual we have a spirit and we're spiritual beings we will live for eternity and so there are people who worship at church and there are people who who may be in a prison cell and jail and the reason for that is that some people are free and some people are imprisoned. And we both live because we both have life. But likewise, after you die, it will be the same. Do you go to the kingdom of God or do you go to hell? And you go to heaven when you receive the Son of God and have eternal life through Him. And so First John already mentions how to lead a proper walk of faith for believers at that time. It's not it was not it is not about dying after receiving salvation. But what must you do while you live after you have been saved? The moment you have received Jesus and accepted Jesus, you have been saved no matter how bad what kind of character you may have and what kind of personality you may have. The moment you have accepted Jesus, you have been saved. It has no, nothing. You have nothing to do with sin and you do not concern hell anymore. Then, we who believe in Jesus, how must we live our lives? First John answers that question. At that time, there was severe persecution by the Roma, Roman Empire and Judaic legalism and Hellenistic thinking and various heretical ideas ideas that went against the Bible were rampant. Amid this reality filled with a culture of darkness, the church members in Asia Minor were gradually losing their power to overcome the world. Because the world was so powerful, they were unable to overcome it. Therefore, First John was written to guide these believers so that they can stand firmly on the truth of the true gospel and live a correct walk of faith in accordance with God's will and plan. In short, it provided a spiritual guidance on how to live a Christian life. The book of First John has various nicknames, including the book of love. 
This is because the Apostle John was called the Apostle of Love. However, during Jesus' public life ministry, John's nickname was opposite to this. He was so impatient and fiery that Jesus called him Son of Thunder. Because of his personality that was so impatient and fiery, he was called the Son of Thunder. However, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the incident of the experience of the Holy Spirit in Mark's upper room, a lot of time had passed and John's old nature began to change. It changed into an apostle of love. That's how he had matured spiritually. An apostle of love. To hate and to judge others is because one lacks love. But people who overflow with love, the closer you go to them, the more love you feel. Do you know what scars children? Is it because they live in poverty? Because they are not clothed nicely? Perhaps those things may be some scars and wounds, but mostly it's because they are unable to receive their mom and their dad's love. No matter how poor you may be, and a family may be, the children, the child feels the, the love from their parents whether they're holding their child's hand with love or not. And that's why when you receive God's love, you are able to love others. And that's why in your ministry or when you're evangelizing or when you're going out and doing missions, what must you have in your heart? You must have fundamentally the heart that loves souls. If you criticize and judge others, that person is not an evangelist. That person has not received God's love. And so I used to do ministry in a prison for seven years. The reason I would go back and forth was because it was to share the gospel. And I realized that these individuals, most of the inmates were orphans. They had never received that parental love from their parents before. And so it, for them, it was difficult for them to understand God's love. So people who do, have not received enough love, they're violent and they are aggressive. And those are some of the signs that one has received insufficient love. And so they do not know how to love others. This Apostle Paul, uh, this Apostle John was called the Son of Thunder. And yet after meeting Jesus, he was transformed into a person of love. A theologian named Jerome said this. Apostle John, who worked in Ephesus, grew older and became weaker and could no longer preach for long. So once in a while, he would go and visit the believers in the church of Ephesus where he ministered and gave a word of advice instead of giving a whole sermon. However, whenever he gave advice, he repeated the same words, little children, love one another. Again, he would say, little children, love one another. He would repeat the same words over and over again. Finally, when the church members were so tired of hearing these words, they asked the apostle why he kept repeating the same words. Apostle John said and answered as follows. He said, because these are the Lord's commands. Because these are the Lord's commands. And if you do them well, and practice them, that is enough. Love one another, that is enough. That's right. What matters, what is important, is the practice to put loving into practice. Without practice, there is no growth. And if there is no growth, then one does not have influence. Love one another. 
all members of Ye One Church through the word of 1 John that is starting today. May you realize that the church is a unity of life made up of the life of Jesus Christ. And realize that the church is a unity of fellowship that shares and spreads that love. May you experience this. Even the one more time evangelism movement in the church. It will bear fruit when we become a gospel unity of life and fellowship. May all regional districts and departments become a gospel unity of life and fellowship. Meditate on this. My ministry and my life, is it headed towards this direction? And may you have the evidence to enlarge the four major tents of the church region, 237 and flesh and blood. Point number one is Christ, the word of life. First John 1 John 1.1 says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Usually, epistles or letters begin with a greeting. However, here, Apostle John directly explains why he wrote this letter um, omitting a greeting. In some ways, you can feel the urgency of Apostle John. This speaks to the severity of the spiritual situation on the field at that time. Here, the word of life from the beginning, in the passage, this refers to Jesus Christ. He is the word of life. In the beginning, in the beginning was the word. It says in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. Even this was recorded by John. In the beginning was the Word. That's how the Gospel of John begins. It's the same thing. However, there is a small difference. In the Gospel of John, the emphasis is in the word, Word. But in 1 John, the emphasis is on the word, Life, proclaimed in Jesus Christ. So, 1 John begins with life and ends with life. That is what 1 John is about. It's about Jesus' life, eternal life. So it begins with life and ends with life. Life in today's text is zoe in Greek and is used more than 120 times in the New Testament. It means the essence or foundation of existence. In other words, it means that Jesus Christ is the source of all creation and the very life that gives life to all creation. That is who Jesus Christ is. And that is why one who has no Christ has no life. Is Jesus Christ in you? Then you have life. You have eternal life. When if, if you say this to unbelievers, they say, oh, then do I not have life? We're not talking about that life, but we're talking about eternal life, Jesus' life. And that is what even Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so even though you die, you will live. Therefore, when you meet Jesus Christ, who is life, people come to life from the dead. People who were once dead come to life. Even Jesus saved those, brought those who were dead to life, like Lazarus. And sick people arise, demons flee. Is there um, among you, are there anyone who is struggling with depression, with anxieties, with various physical illnesses. May you believe that the moment the life of Jesus Christ enters you, that you are healed. John emphasizes that he saw, heard, and touched Jesus Christ. He says that he has seen and heard, touched Jesus Christ. 
This reveals that it is a clear historical fact that Jesus Christ, who is life, came to this earth in the flesh. G John claims and says that he has seen and touched Jesus. He says that I have seen and touched Christ who came to earth. There's a reason for this, for why he mentions that. Because as mentioned in the introduction, various heretical ideas were rampant at that time. A representative example was Gnosticism. Gnosticism refers to the belief in spiritual wisdom. It is being focused on spiritual wisdom. So the Gnostics claim that only they realize spiritual wisdom. However, the spiritual wisdom they speak of do not, does not come from the Bible, but is one that is influenced by Greek philosophy. It was influenced by philosophy. Greek philosophy divided the spiritual and the physical into a dichotomy, and it argues that the spiritual is good and that whatever is physical is evil. That's how it's divided. It's a dichotomy. And influenced by this, God was viewed as a good spirit, and humans, as beings with flesh, they are evil beings. So, they questioned how a good God could appear on earth wearing the evil flesh of a human. That was what they questioned. How is it that God could come to earth wearing the evil flesh of a human? That does not make sense, they said. They claimed that when God came on earth as human in the flesh, that that was not a real appearance. He said, they say that that was false, that was fake. Theo theologically, this is called dustism. At the time, the Gnostics were deceiving believers by questioning how God could come in the flesh. It makes no sense. That's what they said. In short, they denied the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They denied the fact that Christ had, that God had come in the flesh. John explains the incarnation of Jesus in more detail in verse 2. Verse 2 reads, The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. When it says that this life was made manifest to us, the word manifested is Epinerathe in Greek meaning to make visible, to make clear something that already exists. Christ, who existed before eternity was set, was revealed to the world according to God's time schedule. Amen. Is this a little bit difficult? It's very easy. And so listen to it one more time when you go home. John conveys that he saw this eternal life, Jesus Christ, that he saw Jesus Christ who is the life. And he says that I proclaim it as a witness. I am a witness, John claims. John was so close to Jesus that he boasted that no disciple was as loved by Jesus as himself. That's how close he was with Jesus. Although there are many disciples, if you look at John 13, 23, it says, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. Here, the person Jesus loved was John. John was the disciple who was so close to Jesus that he reclined into the arms of Jesus during the Last Supper. He fell into the arms of Jesus. That's how close he was to Jesus. And even Peter asked through Jesus. Peter said, Oh, John, why don't you ask Jesus? That's how close Jesus, that how close John was to Jesus. 
beaten on the cross, Jesus asked John to care for his mother, Mary, because there would be no one to care for his mother once Jesus would ascend. So he entrusted and, and asked John to care for his mother. And there is a, ch a church that John served with me. Uh, that John and Mary served until they both passed away and I've actually visited in real life and that's how realistically John experienced that Jesus is God himself who, the Messiah and Christ who came to earth in the flesh and he proclaims it and he confesses that he is a witness to this work and that is how the epistle of John 1 John begins It's estimated that 1 John was written around AD 90. All the apostles who had personally witnessed Jesus' atonement on the cross, resurrection, and ascension to heaven were now martyred, and only John remained. The first generation of the Gospels, who had received the Gospel directly from the apostles, staked their lives joyfully with thanksgiving to spread the Gospel, had passed. And now this passion for the gospel had cooled down as generations changed. They were in spiritual stagnation. And that's it goes the same for the first generation of our church, including myself. We will all one day pass. Perhaps there might be many who will pass in the next 10 years, starting with me. And in, after 20 years, many first generation will not be present here. Then what will happen? And that is why we are the unique denomination and group that is doing the remnant movement. We focus on raising the next generation so that they may be trained to be only Christ. You know, if our posterity arises that way I think I would go gladly I would pass gladly where other in the world do these denominations exist many churches are closing their doors you know they say oh children just go away many churches they don't have children or young people because they've all gone other in other places and so now more than half of half of the churches have no Sunday school. Most children now and young people come to church because they're forced and dragged by their parents, but n not many churches have young people who come voluntarily. So it was there was a generation where they stake their lives for the gospel joyfully and with thanksgiving, but now as generation changed, that passion for the gospel had cooled down. And, the, and so to rekindle that spiritual flame, John recorded this epistle of 1st John because he was still alive because he was still an, an individual from the first generation there's a reason I love the phrase from Salvation Army founder William Booth are you still burning so much personally I dislike doing anything half-heartedly I really don't like that. And it goes the same for a walk of faith. Why live a walk of faith if you must do it ambiguously lukewarm? It's not this or it's not that. Why would you go to church? Why would you give your time and your money? Not being able to do this or that. Receiving stress. Because when it comes to the church systems, it can be very stressful. Why put in all that effort into that? May you have that burning desire. God, may I have a burning desire for the gospel within me. All members of Yewon Church, may you be on fire with Christ Jesus, the word of life. Because you need to be on fire for to be happy, for it to be fun. That's when you don't envy the world. That's when you have no conflicts and no thoughts and concerns. Your concerns itself, they come from Satan. May you go into God's thought, into the Word of God. 
And with that, may you be greatly used in the works of saving lives. Number two, the life-sharing unity of fellowship. Verses 3 to 4 read, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John the Apostle illustrates specifically the life of those who have met Jesus Christ, the Word of Life. John elaborates on this through four words. First, proclaiming, fellowship, enjoyment, and joy or happiness. These four words are not separate but are naturally connected. The apostles spread the gospel while staking their lives to restore the severed state between God and man through Jesus Christ, who is the life. And the passage describes this as having fellowship with God. The role of, allow, of helping mankind to meet with God. So in that role would also be called a mediator. It's a, like a prophet. Fellowship in Greek is koinonia, which means having a relationship. In other words, proclaiming the gospel to proclaim the gospel is to guide unbelieving souls separate from God to God, helping them have fellowship with God. When um, unbelieving souls who do not know God, you approach them and you allow them to come to God and to have fellowship with God, to worship God, helping them to do so is important and then what comes afterwards is enjoyment oh you know I once was bound by my fate and destiny and my there were family and generational curses in my family and but now now that I'm able to be with God and have fellowship with him and worship him all you got to do is enjoy Apostle John clearly states that the fundamentals of fellowship as a Christian is to enjoy with the father and with his son Jesus Christ it is to enjoy with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so, you know, even the world, they say they enjoy things, right? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about enjoyment that enjoys with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And what comes naturally after that is the fullness of joy. It's joy. What we must focus on is that instead of using the, the word me, John the Apostle repeatedly uses the expression we. This emphasizes that the fellowship with God given by the life of Jesus Christ must be connected to unity. It's about us. It's not something that you taste alone, but it's something to be shared with others. It's not something that you should only keep to yourself, but it's something that you should do with others. Then another fellowship takes place, and true enjoyment and joy will be restored within that fellowship. And this fellowship between believers is called forum. To be able to have that spiritual communication and fellowship and preaching it to unbelievers is called evangelism and mission. And we call that fellowship. And so to tell it to, to unbelievers, it's called evangelism missions. The gospel of life was never granted to possess it alone. It was not given so that only you may be saved. But there is a characteristic of those who have received the gospel. Jesus, when he approached the young person who was demon-possessed, by a legion he and when Jesus casted out those demons and the, those demons went into the pigs and the pigs fell to the cliff the young the young adult he kept following Jesus because he was healed and Jesus said stop following me and Jesus said go and show others that you have been healed so this young person this because he had been healed he went running around his town and proclaimed how he was healed by Jesus and so Jesus visited one more time 
And there were so many people, there were crowds and who were waiting for Jesus because of that one individual who ran around proclaiming how Jesus had healed him. We call that to proclaiming. He con- it happened naturally because he experienced it. It wasn't forced. So, the lady in the well, even though she was married numerous times, Jesus called her out and said, Oh, the man that you are with right now is not your husband, right? And she admitted that. And Jesus said, This water, you drinking this water, you will thirst again, but the water I give you, you will never thirst again. And so then after meeting Jesus again, she went back into her town and she proclaimed of Jesus. She was once a woman who was ashamed who couldn't come to draw water during busy hours and she had to come alone. But now after meeting Jesus, she boldly went into the city and proclaimed. It's not that she needed to be eloquent. She didn't need anything else. All she focused on was that she was healed, that she had met Jesus. The gospel is not about possessing it alone. It's not about only you experiencing it, only you enjoying it. No, that's not what the gospel is. But it is to proclaim and enjoy. And what about the Israelites who held who lost hold of lost hold of this they held on to it and they didn't let go and share with others and because they didn't do so they had to be so sent and scattered as slaves as colonies as captives and so because they wouldn't listen because they would only keep it to themselves they had to be scattered as slaves as captives as colonies and because even then they couldn't realize They became a wandering nation for 2,000 years, even to this point. That's what happens when you don't realize. And so may you pray. God, may you give me the spirit to realize the gospel. And above all, when we share the gospel of atonement and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we proclaim it, a joy within us will be restored. I've already spoken about this before. When you receive grace, And when you share that joy with others and you share grace with others, there were many times when I would sit down and do that with other believers and then it would be done. So I didn't realize the time had passed so late. And that didn't just happen once or twice. Whenever we'd meet, we'd we'd spend the entire night because talking and sharing the grace that we've received, how... And we wouldn't even be tired. You must know the spiritual mystery. A life that proclaims and enjoys the life of Jesus Christ is the most blessed life. If you really live a life of an evangelist, oddly, what surges from deep down your heart is joy. And it's a joy that the world does not know nor can give. And that joy is something that only those who have proclaimed the gospel knows. Why did the evangelist Paul go all in and focus on proclaiming the gospel despite all the sufferings and hardships? Because he tasted joy. He tasted the joy that comes from saving lives. If you look at Philippians 1.18, in prison, Paul proclaims as follows. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. To live is Christ. Yes, and I will rejoice. When Paul was imprisoned, those who were irritated and jealous of Paul took it as a chance and said, Oh, finally, it's our turn. Now we will share the gospel. And so they took lead and led the the ministry. And although they were preaching and doing ministry with the wrong motivation of aggravating Paul's struggle, Paul, hearing this, confesses even that, even all those ministries that they were doing to aggravate him only served him to rejoice. Young believers, were you at loss? Was your pride hurt? Do people not acknowledge you? Do people dismiss you easily? May you experience joy like the Apostle Paul. 
through the One More Evangelist Movement, may everyone realistically experience this joy. It's an opportunity that has been presented to you that you may experience healing and realize how tremendous answers and blessings are hidden within this. And so, I bless you in the name of the Lord to have the evidence to expand the tent of your field by doing so. This is the conclusion. There is a term, forest bathing. It means to bathe in the woods, where you breathe in air and the scent of the forest for medical treatments or your health. And when you do this and bathe in the forest, you can experience the effect of sterilization from phytoncide released in the forest and of and you can also experience mental liberation from the green sceneries and it gives you some type of stability mentally and this is significantly good for your body but there's something even better and that is to have spiritual forest bathing what that is is experiencing the amazing power of life in Jesus Christ as time goes by you need to more realistically and accurately realize the width, length, depth, and height of the love of Jesus Christ. The love of the cross represents the width of Jesus Christ's love. Anyone who believes in Jesus will not perish and have eternal life. Anyone, even murderers, even those on a on a life sentence the moment they accept Christ even though they have to be executed because they have committed sins in this world but spiritually they can receive eternal life back then there was capital punishment so many people were executed but there are pastors who would go and preach the gospel to those who were to be executed although they are given they're put to death on earth but through Jesus Christ are given this eternal life and one who experiences the width of this love turns into a gospel nature that can embrace everyone and the length now the length of the love of Jesus Christ is a love that continues from before creation to eternity and the height of the love is the love that saved us from the death and despair and raised us to the heavenly throne a love that has brought us to the kingdom of God, to the throne of God's kingdom. And the depth of this love is the love that bore this cross for my place, even to death. Where can such perfect love, real love, be found? May all Ye one believers experience this very love of Jesus Christ in greater abundance every day amid any circumstances and I bless you in the name of the Lord to be those who share that love enjoy that love and who live happy lives being filled with that joy and to be the absolute disciples of Christ may we pray Father God May Yewon Church become a, you know, a church uh, that is a gospel unity of fellowship and life. And every day, may there be fellowship that shares life. May, we be, may all believers be filled with the love of Jesus Christ. And may we be able to share that love to, to everyone. And may we not lose hold of that love. But may we be able to live a life of true love, a true a life of true joy, and a life of true enjoyment and prosperity. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.